How are cities collaborating to shape national policies on migration? To explore the topic of cities shaping migration policy, please welcome our final panel of the day. Your moderator, Andrew Edgecliffe Johnson, U.S. Business Editor, Financial Times. Former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark. David Miliband from the International Rescue Committee. Senator for Ontario, Ratna Omigvar. And Lefteris Papagianakis, Vice Mayor, Athens. All right, thank you very much and um, welcome to you all. As we, uh, the FT, feel um, uh, we share the interest in this subject. We can just see uh, yeah, the world witnessing a historic surge in migration, and uh, not just cities that we cover, but nations that we cover, even businesses that we cover, are all trying to grapple with us. And we're increasingly fascinated by the intersection between them. Um, we're here to discuss the extent to which cities can shape the policy around that challenge and that opportunity of migration. Um, I don't think this panel need mu needs much of an introduction, so I'm going to skip straight off to, um, to the discussion. David has set out the scale of the challenge um, surrounding refugees and the opportunities he sees um, in that as well. Um, the scale of migration writ larger is um, an order of magnitude bigger, roughly 10 times. Um, the majority of those migrants, those cross-border migrants, will head for global cities first and make their lives there in many cases. Um, this is creating growing pressure uh, on cities around the world, um, from Canada to Greece. Um, I read this morning that the largest single group of um, people seeking asylum in the US last year were from Venezuela. This is a constantly changing mm. um, makeup, constantly changing challenge. Um, but policy is still set mostly at the national level and at the international um, level as well. Um, cities, I think many of the people in this room tend to see the upside of migration, the economic opportunity that migration represents. National politics are often much, much more focused on the cost, the fear factor. So how can we bridge that gap? I'm gonna start off by asking Helen to set the, the big picture scene for us. What is driving this shift in migration, this kind of, this uh, this pressure on migration, the challenge for global cities, and how do you see that evolving in the next coming years? Well, I, th I think there's, if you like, two sets of drivers. I mean, a lot of global cities are looking for workforce. They're looking for tech skills. They're looking for you know, people who, who, who are not present in their current workforce. So they're, they're scouring the world, really wanting uh, those skilled people to, to, to drive their economies. Then you have the other migration, which is coming from almost the perfect storm, which is the perpetuation of extreme poverty and poverty of opportunity, uh, straight out oppression, conflict, uh, and then, of course, increasingly environmental factors as well. You know, take, take Somalia, which uh, only in the last uh, three to four years has been through you know, just one of those terrible droughts that should have been a, could have been a famine. I see the head of UN Humanitarian Affairs is now saying Somalia potentially faces famine again now, barely three years uh, later. Uh, so that perfect storm is creating a, a lot of movement. You look at what's happening in Khartoum and other cities in Sudan today, if, if that's not resolved fast, you're gonna see another outpouring of people trying to escape the, the Janjaweed, which caused such terrible misery in, in uh, Darfur, and not too distant past, and is now you know, ravaging through, through Khartoum. So th there's all those push factors too, and, and that's probably what the international debate tends to focus on, the, the boatloads on the Mediterranean, the, the people at the, the US, US border. Uh, and of course, you know, a, a lot of things changed at home would release uh, some of those pressures, uh, but um, you know, what's gonna change in Venezuela? What's gonna change in Sudan, what's going to change in the other countries that are, are generating this flow? So, Ratna, I was in Toronto earlier this year. I spoke to um, Mayor John Tory. Um, Canada is famously welcoming of, um, of migration, of refugees. Um, Toronto, I believe, is now 51% of the population was born outside Canada. Um, it's had an open door, it's had a very successful 
record of integrating migrants over the years. Um, sitting where you sit in Ontario, surrounded by the heart of it, what do you think has changed in the last couple of years in this, in this challenge? I think the single factor that has changed is uh, populism and people's perception about both immigrants and refugees. And that gets, has gotten in the way of sound national policies and governance. And cities don't have a place uh, at that table. And I think because cities are densely populated, where the connection is not abstract, it's my neighbor who comes from South Sudan. And the postman delivers mail to a new family that's come from New Delhi. It's that close connection that, that mitigates populism uh, of this kind. And yet cities do not have uh, a role in, uh, in developing or contributing to policies at the national level. You know, they're first responders. I think of cities as first responders to migration, whether it's national, transnational, voluntary, or, for, or, or forced, so they have to house, they have to feed, they have to pick up the garbage, the, the kids have to be put in school. So the business of doing, I think, in a way, uh, gets in the way of them responding at a policy level. They have all the responsibility, they do not have any of the authority or the resources. But we see some changes happening, perhaps, at a, you know, I don't want to have too much time, Talk well, about I it wanna, later. I'm going to come back to you on the populism yeah. point. Yes. Um, um, but Lefteris, um, Greece is, has been literally on the front line um, of this challenge. We've all watched the images of uh, people arriving in the islands over the last several years. I know David spent time there. Um, can you just set the scene for us about what's, what you're dealing with in Athens? You're vice mayor with responsibility for migration and refugees. What, what does that entail at the moment? Um, first of all, we have to keep in mind that the city doesn't have the competency to do these things. So it's based on political will of the mayor. So it's another sign that mayors have an increased role in this context. So the mayor decided to, you know, get into the game instead of pointing fingers at the government and saying, you're responsible, help me. So we did a number of things. I don't want to take a lot of the time. Um, we changed the administration, we collaborated with the private sector and um, c um, civil society. IRC is one of our biggest uh, supporters and uh, partners, and we try to do what the municipality has to do, offer services to everyone without any type of discrimination. That's the role of the municipality. It's not a question of like or dislike, that's the role of the municipality, that's it. Keeping social cohesion, helping everyone, participating in, you know, in the basic services, but also innovate, find other ways to help more people. Because Greece, although we have, in Greece we have migrants for many years, we never actually worked on migration, on integration, sorry. So we were forced to do integration, as a country I mean, and as a system, because of the situation in 2015. And this is very quickly, we did it in three years, and in four now. But also we implement the European policy, with the islands, the hotspots, the EU-Turkey common declaration or agreement, if you want, which is, a di and this is my personal opinion, it is a disaster. So I mean, it is a policy that perpetuates issues and it's only, a, you know, it's like a hamster in a cage running around in the wheel, staying in the same spot and just creating problem and issues that we have to manage. So we are creating the issue and we manage it, which is kind of you not effective. Run, can you run through some numbers for us? How many people are we talking about? Yes, well, in Greece we have actually around 80,000 people 60,000 are in the mainland, and I'm not talking about the islands. Unfortunately, the islands are a disgrace to all of us, and we have to keep it, you know, we have to talk about it, but I'm not mentioning it as something normal or uh, useful. And uh, in Athens, we have 18,000 refugees and asylum seekers, meaning 30% of the people who are in the mainland are in the city of Athens. Because usually when we talk about Athens, people think about the greater area of Athens, which has 4 million people. We, it's not that case. We have 665,000 inhabitants, so we are dealing with, the numbers are not big, to be honest. We can manage, yeah. right. and it's not very difficult, and we, we've, we've seen it work. But we lack uh, the budget, we lack uh, the, the personnel, the experience, and time. So, David, you have a little experience of, the, of, of national government. Um, this, this discussion presupposes that cities are gonna sort of 
take more responsibility away from national governments, doesn't it? Do you see, do you see places like Westminster actually wanting to surrender any authority over this, any decision making? I'm not sure if it's that um, cities are taking power away from uh, national governments. I, I see, I think we, you quoted my colleague who works on urban policy saying, nation states talk and cities act. In this and, report, which I hope you all read. <laughs> in your outstanding article. And uh, um, what I see is nation states, but also state governments relying on their urban centers being effective. And the truth that we've learned about this flow of people is that if you don't go to them and address it, then they will come to you in ways that are less well organized, less well protected, and less well productive. And I think that uh, the challenge for cities is to go from a reactive state to a proactive state. As you think about city plans, how are you thinking about flows of people? As you think about housing and other policies, how are you thinking about flows of people? And that's hard in a, in a context where there's electoral politics and where there's money. Where there's no electoral politics and where there's very little money, that's even more um, difficult. But I think that the, the national governments can pro provide the enabling environment, or they can simply dump the problem, or what's perceived to be the problem. Cities have the choice, are we going to be proactive or are we going to be re reactive? And the point I would make is that all the drivers that I can see of the flow of people as a result of conflict, Helen's given the broader picture, they are trends, not blips. Yeah. And if you add in climate stress, then you've got a further multiplier. So preparing proactively seems to me a prudent thing to do. Um, and the challenge is how do you square it with commitments to your own population? Because you know, in, in Amman, the unemployment rate among Jordanians, I think, is a, above 30%. So the issue of how you extend employment opportunities to Syrians is a very, um, very challenging issue. You've got to expand the pie somehow. Helen, do you agree with that idea that this isn't a question of seizing power from one body and you know, from, from national bodies and bringing it to the local level? Yeah, absolutely, because really the cities are in the position of having to respond pragmatically to circumstances that are on their doorstep, uh, which national governments haven't been able to, uh, to, to prevent, uh, may not have welcomed, but, but couldn't prevent. So the cities have got to get on with it, and they've got to try and get the services in place and, and, and get an adequate response. Uh, I think that uh, it's very encouraging to see this Mayor's Migration Council yes. uh, formed. And I would like to see it get the kind of profile that the C40 cities on uh, climate change have got. And just the C40 cities is hooked into all the processes around the international climate talks and agreements. I think that the Mayor's Migration Council could hook on to the global framework for safe, orderly and inclusive uh, migration as, as giving them some guidance because that is about how do we cooperate and how do we learn from each other? What's the best practice in Athens? What are they doing in Toronto? Uh, how are others coping? Uh, so l let's encourage the mayors networking like this on good responses. So Athens is a member of an early signatory to the Mayor's Migration Council, um, one of the first cities to sign up. Can you explain to us why you decided to join and what the ambition there is. It's obviously early days. I think it's only formed in December, but... Um, it's a long process that lasted, I think, four years. Uh, the mayor met people in the UN, and from there we moved on. And we decided to participate for the same reason. We decided to be involved in the management of uh, the migration... I don't like to call it a crisis, but for the sake of the discussion, crisis. So we are there because we believe that cities need to take a stronger stand and need to be part of the discussion. And let me give you a very quick example that you know, points that out. Um, I, we are members of Eurocities, another, uh, another big network of European cities. Five years ago, we didn't participate in any type of discussion concerning the budget, for example. We were just asking for direct access to European funds, which is not permitted for the moment. Now the Commission is thinking about doing this. It's, pro it's proposing to the Council, which is complicated. But it's changing. So cities are on the table participating. Cities participated in the global compacts also. I did it for Greece and for UNHCR Greece, in Geneva and in other cities in some rounds of negotiation. We did some input for issues that we are concerned about. And this has been very, very interesting. And uh, it actually works. Not Athens on, on her own. 
But if you have the backing of big cities like New York, Los Angeles, Montreal, Barcelona, Paris, etc., etc., you can do it. I mean, it's, it's there. And we need to take the responsibility. Right. I, I, I find that interesting because in my work on migration, I have noticed, not just in the context of migration, but in the context of climate change, opioid crises, etc., cities are much more nimble at adapting, replicating, adjusting, stealing ideas from each other than nation state. Nation states have ideologies, they have history, all of that, whereas cities, you know, Athens can borrow from Copenhagen, who can borrow from London, and we have a, a, a network of uh, cities that should be working far more closely together on how they have translated their local wisdom into uh, opening up levers of power with state and federal governments. We don't so, have borders. That's a very important point. Right. Yeah. We don't have borders. Yeah. So um, I think there's, there's pretty widespread agreement in this crowd that you know, cities, cities are nimble. They can ha they, they're, 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 they're keen to crack this challenge. Um, David, do you think they can do anything to change the national debate in countries where it has become increasingly toxic around mm -hmm. migration? Well, I think one's got to have, um, one's got to live in hope, and one's got to believe that um, facts are still worth uh, something in a world of uh, fiction. I I'd say a couple of things. First of all, there's nothing like demonstrating that a diverse community is a productive and effective community. And remember, all of the polling we've got shows that our urban centers are the most comfortable with diversity. And uh, I think that the, the economics of that are really important. Um, secondly, I think that the voice of the cities is, has got to be strong within nations as well as internationally. I worry, um, you know, I'm, I live and work in New York, but I'm obviously not, a, not an American. The, um, the, 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 the state authorities have an outsized impact. The governors have an outsized voice in American public policy compared to the mayors. And, uh, the American Conference of Mayors seems to me to have a lot more to say since it's the economic drivers in the, uh, of the majority of the country. And I think that the national voice, you, you can't really have an international voice until you've got national yeah. voice. And I think the national voice could be far more effective. The third thing, which I think is really important, is a big lesson for organizations like mine. The most effective advocates uh, for the patriotic and productive contribution that refugees or asylum seekers can make to the countries that they land in is not people in suits like me. They are refugees themselves. I mean, there's a refugee who's now the mayor of Helen, Helena, Montana in uh, the United States. Um, these are our neighbors, our workmates. They're entrepreneurs. They're scientists. Um, they are people who go on to make a contribution, ordinary and extraordinary, to the countries that, and the cities that they land in. And I think that voice is important as well. It's not just the elected voice. It's also the, the, the stories, um, because really, there, there is a, the, the fake news that is run against uh, the uh, um, idea that you can welcome people and prosper is strong. And the best way to counter it is probably with the real stories. Right. So, um, Rana, David earlier framed this as a question of both politics and financing, politics yes. and money. Um, and talking about the, the role of the sort of state governors in the US, is, is, there's an interesting analogy in Canada where you have a federal government that's been very welcoming, you have Toronto City, which has been very welcoming. In the middle tier, you have a provincial government uh, uh, run by Doug Ford now, who is a populist. Um, how is that playing out in the battle of politics and money in Ontario? I think we have a really interesting situation where uh, out of this populist chaos, let's say, innovation has arisen. So uh, the arrangements, Canada's a young country, our confederation is very young, I would say, and so the arrangements between the three levels of government are very carefully calibrated. Uh, but because populist governments in, in Canada, we have an anti-migration government in Quebec, uh, we have a populist government in Ontario. Because they refuse to deal with the federal government on these matters of migration for the first time, the federal government in Canada is talking directly to the mayor of Tor Toronto, talking directly to the mayor of Mississauga, and money is flowing 
directly bypassing uh, the provincial government. So I think this is an interesting opening. We'll see whether that gets embraced and, and, and broadened. But uh, even in this case, populism has created uh, something that I certainly did not expect. And this is, by the way, also happening on, opioid, on the opioid crisis. Uh, the federal government is dealing directly uh, with uh, the local government in Toronto and other governments to inject funding uh, for safe uh, injection sites because the provincial government says, we're not going there. So there are, there are, there's precedent. Um, in Athens, how does this, dis this financial discussion happen between the national, dis uh, national government and the city government? How is money flowing? It's a complicated discussion, first of all. <laughs> it's always complicated. Um, we have a real crisis in Greece for 10 years now, the financial crisis. So it means that because we have austerity policies implemented, uh, the municipalities lost 40% of their income, directly you know, funded by the government. So we had to find other solutions uh, in order to compensate. Uh, of course, local taxes are not enough. And you, we didn't get any money for managing migration so, and the flows of people. So we had to find other ways to complete the, the, the task. So we were lucky enough to have some European funding through the European Social Fund, uh, private partners who donated money to cities, uh, private foundations, uh, to Athens and to Thessaloniki, the second biggest city for social purposes. And we used that funding to do things to keep social cohesion alive. So, but it is a difficult discussion because we don't have the experience to do it. So the municipalities do not have that role. The regions who are in the middle, they're very fairly new to this game, and the government has also other political you know, imperatives in mind. And we have elections in one month, so everything stops for at least three months for the new government to take over. So we are in a gap, in a, in a black hole. And still people move and they come to the city and the islands and we need to find other ways to be present. Legally we are not because it's not allowed due to the electoral law. But you know, we are not talking about numbers or money. We are talking about people who move every day, every second. And this is something that you cannot stop it. So, I mean, all, all cities are not created economically equal. And when you go to Toronto, you know, you see the startup scene there. It's pretty easy to understand the attraction of a kind of young, vibrant uh, population moving in and be, being with a great record of uh, being entrepreneurial uh, and the, the appeal of migration to a city like Toronto. You know, after a financial crisis like Greece has been through, it's got to be a different proposition. In a place like Khartoum, it's a different proposition altogether. Do you, do you think one size fits all in this, in this discussion or do you think there is a radical um, difference in the extent to which cities will be able to shape national debate on migration for the poorest cities and the richest cities? Uh, I, th I think there's so many different contexts here, uh, depending on how power is distributed, and the Canadian example clearly is that you know, the provinces have got quite a lot of power, states in the US have got quite a lot of power. In New Zealand and maybe in Greece, which is also a, a small country, we don't have that sort of intermediate level, so you, the government does have to deal directly with cities. And we also uh, don't actually delegate power in terms of education and health and social services uh, down to that level. We're, we're quite centralised uh, in, in this. So when there are pressures, and you know, in New Zealand there's Auckland and there's everywhere else, Auckland is really the only city of, of global scale and that's where the migrants want to be and the city is swollen and swollen and swollen. And it's also a reality that about 70% of the, of the economic growth of New Zealand in recent years was coming off migration. But, but it was done in a kind of laissez-faire way so that Auckland then had the, the traffic issues from the sprawl, the housing pressures, and it needed immensely more coordination between the, the central government and the, the local government to address the issues uh, that were arising as the city was undoubtedly benefiting from, from growth. So what does all this call for? A lot more discussion, collaboration, mechanisms for, for central and local governments to get together so they can shape this future rather than you know, have, have the unwanted uh, aspects of it like overly high uh, housing, urban sprawl and uh, traffic gridlock uh, resulting from sudden population movements. Oh, David, you're traveling 
very widely to a huge diversity of, um, uh, of cities. Do you see any common threads between the ones yeah, that have Yes, I do. I mean, first of all, what's the alternative? The alternative is that people get put in refugee camps. Yeah. Well, no, those are funeral homes for dreams. Mm -hmm. And they get set up as temporary camps, and they end up being uh, permanent. Or they're left in parts of the country that have less capacity mm -hmm. to go with the ebb and flow. Um, so that's point one. Point two, there are some common risks. There are risks to the, to the um, uh, migrating population, risks especially to kids, to unaccompanied kids. And so what we mean by protection and the way in which the humanitarian sector protects vulnerable groups, I think, is, very, um, is a common uh, thread. And the exploitation of kids and of women is a common threat that exists in many of these um, environments. Secondly, there's a common risk that there is tension between the local population and the uh, migrant population. You have to build that into your public policy. But there's also opportunities. We haven't really talked about the private sector's role in this. But in many of the cities that we're, we're talking about, they are the most vibrant parts of the countries that we're talking about. And to the extent that there's going to be private sector dynamism outside the agricultural sector, there's a big need for the cities and the private sector to get into harness. And I think that's where you begin to change the dynamic with central government. When central government faces not just a, a, if you like, a dispute between different tiers of government, but you have the private sector weighing in with cities to make demands on central government, then you're in a different kind of place. I mean, this business is a political actor. It's increasingly yeah, exactly. a, a cross-border political actor. Can you, can you kind of ride on that as a city? You know, can you can you sort of weaponize that and use business to to project your message to the national and international stage? I, I believe the time has come to do things differently around cities and their demand for labor. Let's start with with labor. Canada is addicted to highly skilled immigrants. Mm -hmm. We somehow are not able to re understand that an economy, even a local economy, is made up of professors and lawyers who also need to drink coffee. So we have a huge labor market shortage in the service industry. And it is the hotel industry in Toronto that is going, that will come together. And I should, they should make a proposal to the federal government for city visas. It's time for city visas. Uh, when the refugee crisis erupted from Syria, we had uh, KPMG work with us uh, to sponsor uh, uh, Syrian refugees, and they first said, you know, it would be really nice to get accountants. And I said, no, we're not going to find designer refugees for you. Refugees are refugees. You want to sponsor a refugee? So it was the business community that pushed the numbers at the federal government. So it is, you know, it is time to broaden who's in this tent, both usual and unusual actors. I want to um, throw this open to the audience and give you the opportunity to throw some questions at the panel. Um, we have a couple of microphones uh, uh, wandering around, so just put your hand up and uh, we will get a mic to you if you have a question for the panel. While you're, while you're thinking about your brilliant questions, I want to just come back to you, Ratna, about a specific uh, follow-up on the financial financing point. Yes. You have a proposal going through the Senate at the moment. Um, can you explain what you're trying to do with that? Thank you. Um, uh, I have a piece of legislation in the Senate of Canada, which hopefully will make its way through. It builds on the Magnitsky Act, which uh, freezes the assets of corrupt foreign officials in four jurisdictions, Canada, UK, US, and Estonia. Uh, but this proposal... I've got to ask why. I, you'd have to, you're the journalist, sir. You'd have to find out why. Um, we, uh, this proposal will go beyond freezing to seizing and repurposing the assets through court order, so no politicians hands in this. And it, they, the assets, if the court order de decrees it as such, will be repurposed uh, to help those who have been harmed the most. And I draw a direct line between corrupt foreign officials their oppression of the people, and displacement. On the Magnitsky list in Canada, we have generals from Myanmar, we have warlords from Darfur, we have people from uh, Central and South America, and these are the countries that are producing refugees at an alarming stage. And let's not even talk about the displaced people. I mean, that's a whole other issue. So this is an idea that could go as viral as the Magnitsky Act did. Right. Um, well, uh, let's uh, do um, 
do let us do. Don't be shy if you have a question. Or I'm going to keep going. But the um, uh, Helen, you said at the beginning the you the felt mic. there was a chance. Oh, you do. Sorry, there's a microphone in Would you just tell us who you are and uh, sure. where you're from? Sure. Scott Bernstein, Center for Neighborhood Technology. Picking up on the senator's suggestion for legislation, then. It does seem that cities could be budgeting creatively, either through incentives to repurpose buildings or to accept that uh, migrants are a permanent part of the landscape going forward. Um, you know, have you given any thought to uh, what the role then is for cities in um, taking leadership on this, much in the way that they've taken leadership on, on climate change? You know, could it also be that there's a role for planning for the resilience, for the slack capacity that's needed, rather than reacting to it uh, after the fact. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Uh, is that to me, Andrew? Let me take a, uh, one response to it. I think uh, one of the uh, planning, yes, but in order to get to planning, we need the data. And cities are not, I mean, many cities in the world have some data, but most cities are, are, are not able to collect the data in, a, in an evidence-based, disciplined way so that we can look at trends and say, because of we know this, we can project that tomorrow. Um, and if we were able to do that, we could embed mobility and urban planning together so that we create city structures, neighborhoods, roads, housing, schools that are more immediately uh, responsive to the needs of cities as opposed to be after the fact. And one of the, the unintended outcomes of not planning for migration is the spread, is the urban spread of cities like Toronto, which are not growing like this, but growing wide, creating walls of inequality. There was a wonderful comment by the professor from Columbia. You know, they are invisible walls, but they are walls of inequality. So, you know, data, Planning, investment should go hand in hand. How much data do you have on this? Um, I come from a country where data is a question. And uh, <laughs> we used it, you know, in various ways, not very well. But now the city is, uh, you know, collaborating with the Greek Statistical Authority and Eurostat, which is the European one, to start creating data for the city as, as a pilot project. And we will use that data to make a bit of planning because in Greece we usually do the policy and then we count. Although it's the other way around. But... Now we have to change it because we are doing different things. So planning is something that we need. We don't have it now for the moment, but we are starting to working on that also. So it is a very important part of the policy of the city. Again, outside of the competency, again, but we try to push that policy to the government in order to, that they, this will come back to us in a way. Helen, you want yes, to I wanted to bring the climate change migration issue yep. uh, into this and what it means for cities. Uh, the World Bank, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, produced a report on what was the likely scale of climate change uh, induced migration. They came up with a figure of 143 million people uh, across sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. And that's not counting East Asia and Southeast Asia, by the way, which is which is very vulnerable. But they went on to say, and I, and I agree with this, that most of the migration will not be across border. It will be internal. internal. People are going to come to cities. And that puts a, a different lens on how we adapt to ch climate change, because often we're thinking about the seawall and you know, the, the, the rural production with more, more salt in the water or whatever. But actually, one of the key parts of adaptation for many developing countries is going to be how the cities absorb these many tens of millions uh, more, more people. And that's going to require capacity for planning, right, for services, for, for housing, for many, many pressures. So I think that uh, when, when we think adaptation and you know, good countries like Canada with their aid budget, the UK, uh, role of the Green Climate Fund, Will it be able to support cities to get on top of their game to absorb these very significant numbers of people in the not too distant future? That prompts a related thought that I, I talked to Mayor Tory about in Toronto, which is you know, everybody comes to Toronto. It's the magnet, it's the, the op economic opportunity for, for many migrants. But there are cities, smaller cities all around Toronto 
which are crying out for labor. Yes. Uh, it's a very tight job market. But they don't necessarily have the resources, the structures set up to teach people uh, the language, to have house people, to provide childcare and things so people can get to work. Um, how much work needs to be done in kind of distributing the migrant population, not just inside the global city, but in the, the, those smaller cities? I don't, David may have views on this as well. But. Look, our experience is that um, you can be in Boise, Idaho, as well as in um, Los Angeles or in New York. And the smaller cities, it's not right that they don't have the childcare infrastructure or other things. There's plenty of um, uh, flex uh, there. But I think there is a responsibility on governments to think hard, um, especially when they're doing refugee resettlement, where do they place people? Because we're, there are two models, remember. If you're an asylum seeker, you choose where to go. If you're being resettled as a refugee from a third country, you're given a, a docket and told this is where you're going. We've actually been doing some very interesting work with Stanford University. We've done a regression analysis on our last 10 years of refugee resettlement across the US. We think you could deliver a 40% improvement in employment rates if you follow the lessons of the algorithm that we've developed just to try and hit that employment target. And if you're trying to match skills, if you're trying to help people into communities, there's a way of distributing that can be far more scientific and effective than the pretty random way it goes at the moment. And I, I think there's actually a lot of experience that, simple point, the, the mega cities like Toronto, often they have the highest housing costs. Yep. So it's very tough for us to resettle or yep. to help people find their way in a, in a high rent area. Actually, you're better off they're going to Oakland rather than into San Francisco. Yep. For an example, so what's the discussion in the provincial government or the, the Senate? At, at the federal government, I think uh, we all agree in Canada that the dispersion of immigrants throughout the country is an important one for reasons of social cohesion. Otherwise, we're going to be three multicultural cities and yep. maybe four and the rest of Canada. And this is where I think there is an opportunity for mid-sized cities like Halifax, like Thunder Bay, who are losing population. It's part of a worldwide trend. And we've got businesses and local institutions in these places banding together and creating opportunities and making uh, plans and pledges uh, on immigration. I'd like to see that you know, translated into into a discourse that is easily accessible through languages such as the city visa, because I, I really think the time has come for cities to say, state governments set, set aside, we have the capacity, we have the knowledge, because whilst migration might be national or international, integration is always uniquely local. So the local wisdom is there, and, and I believe there are opportunities opening up now. Mm -hmm. Can we get a microphone to the front here just for another question? Thanks so much. I, I'm Robert Mugga, and thank you so much for a great, a great panel. Um, really, uh, one of the big casualties in any of these emergencies, whether it's a mass crisis, a mass influx, or small, is information. Uh, and often refugees themselves, who are incredibly enterprising people for the most part, who are survivors, who are uh, extraordinarily rich in agency, uh, are, are seeking more information to be able to bridge that gap. Uh, and, and David, you raised something about technology. I'm just curious if any of the panelists have some reflections mm -hmm. on what is the role, you've got a bunch of folks from the tech sector here, what, what, what kinds of technologies would you advocate to bridge that information gap, that information asymmetry? Um, and I know there's a lot of hype around this, so maybe yeah. are there any warnings about maybe being overly reliant on technology? I mean, as it happens, we've got a really good example from, that we've developed over the last four years in Greece, and we're now expanding to the Middle East and actually to El Salvador as well. It's called Signpost. It was originally called Refugee.info. I mean, what did we find when the refugees arrived in Greece? The first thing they did when they got off the boat is you take your mobile phone out yeah. of your pocket, and you switch on, and it was all Greek. So it wasn't very helpful to them. So we went, to, um, we went in with uh, Google, actually, and got some of their software engineers to design I don't want to call it TripAdvisor for refugees, but a service um, information platform that eventually did actually allow them to rate different services. And this is a trusted shop to use. These people won't rip you off. This is really a good information center. And 800,000 refugees used this service after 2015. Um, so we've now taken it to the Middle East. Fair dues to Google. They then gave us another set of software engineers to go and work on it in the Middle East. Um, in El Salvador, where we're trying to um, roll it out, um, we started last August, you've got people on the run from gangs, and they want to be able to f uh, 
they say, look, I'm in northern El Salvador, I'm worried where around here is safe, we've now got people 24-7 able to answer that. It's not just, you're not just speaking to a machine, there's a human element to it as well. It's now called signpost. I'd be very happy to give you some more information about it. But that's actually a very practical example of the way technologies are genuinely enabling and empowering um, resource Ron, if you want to come in on that. Well. I agree 100% with what you've said, but I think technology can also be the opposite of an enabler. And I'm talking about immigrants as opposed to refugees, because technology enables you to stay emotionally connected somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And we have more and more communities, in, in our country at least, that are you know, physically in one place, but emotionally in another. And this is where I think the role of local institutions in drawing people out into the common public space is, has become even more important. So I see it as an essential for refugees, and there are wonderful examples of David and other institutions work, but I do have a concern about how do we use technology for social cohesion as, as opposed to for staying connected with your old world, wherever that world was from. Yeah, but I, I live in New York and I still listen to the BBC, so does that make me <laughs> is, emo, emotionally disconnected, I think, from my, well, uh, from my new environment? Sir, sir you, have, you have the advantage of language. Yeah. You are, so when, when you've got people yeah. who, I mean, I have, I've sponsored a, Rus a Syrian refugee family of 12. They're wonderful people. But they're not learning English because their TV is set to whatever station I'd they're I want to hear more to. about that family. We've, we've, we've run out of time, and Evo yeah. runs a tight ship. So uh, we'd better wrap it up. I know there is a workshop this afternoon on this subject. Um, so if you haven't already uh, signed up, I encourage you to do so. But um, I just want to thank my panelists very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.